Hello, it's Cred here, with my first video on a series of Marvel Snap Guides to make you better at Marvel Snap. If you don't know me, I have some of the most detailed and in-depth breakdowns for Elden Ring. One of my friends knows about my love for breaking down numbers and requested a series on Marvel Snap that will help you become a better deck builder. Marvel Snap combines many interesting features, such as locations and the ability to wager your cubes to create a truly unique game. I have found myself often playing this game during my spare time as well. Today, we're going to be talking about the very basics of single card draw probabilities, and these four specific cards, three of which players get really early on, since you'll be getting them in card pool 1. I will go into more card draw probabilities in part 2 of the video, but for now, let's understand the basics of single card draw probabilities. Unlike some other card games like Legends of Runeterra, Gwent, or Hearthstone, Marvel Snap has a small deck size of 12, but none of the cards can repeat. This makes Marvel Snap's game length shorter on average than any of the aforementioned games, which not only makes it quite nice for a mobile game, but it also sets a different pace of its own. A regular game lasts 6 turns, and you start the game with 3 cards in hand. You draw a card at the start of every turn. This means that on a regular game, you're going to be drawing 9 out of the 12 cards in your deck. One thing that you will see soon enough with the probabilities, but you can probably tell intuitively right now, is that a strong Marvel Snap deck usually consists of more than one win condition, as relying completely on drawing a single card requires quite a high win rate when you do draw that card. For example, pre pool 3, you typically won't find that many Spectrum decks, as you really only have Spectrum as a finisher to buff your ongoing cards. However, once you reach pool 3, Destroyer ends up being a great second finisher, since Armor, Cosmo, Colossus, Professor X, and Warpath are all great ongoing cards that pair well with Destroyer 2. Although, there are cards like Mr. Negative in Card Pool 3 that can bait some good snaps for 4 to 8 sweet cubes whenever you do draw him and get the combo off, meaning you can advance quite a bit because your opponents might not expect such a large point swing, despite the deck having a relatively lower win rate. But that is for another day, and much more specific. Let's get started with some card draw probabilities per turn. One question you probably immediately have is, why do I bother labeling turns 7 to 9, when games usually only last 6 turns? Well, that is because locations such as Limbo extends the game by 1 turn, whereas locations such as Olympia, or if you do win Asgard, effectively, effectively pushes your probability forward by 2 turns, as you essentially draw two more cards like you would in two more turns. Limbo is also fairly easy to pull off if you run magic yourself. Also, if your opponent runs cards like Yondu and don't hit the card you're searching for, they effectively advance your turn by one, increasing the probability of drawing any specific card left in your deck. The probability of drawing any specific card on turn one is basically 3 plus 1 divided by 12 which is 4 divided by 12, or 33.33% of the time, since you have 4 cards in hand out of 12. It also means that every subsequent turn, you're essentially adding one more card to the numerator as you draw the next card. These are the chances of drawing a specific card in your deck by the X number of turn. In a normal deck, you expect to see a card 75% of the time by turn 6, which means that there is a whole 25% chance you'll never see the card you've placed into your deck. Thus, if your deck relies on a single card by turn 6 to win you the game, and you'll just lose the game completely if you don't draw the card, you will need to have a win rate of over 66.66% to have an overall win rate over 50%. Still possible, of course, but a lot harder, especially because people can retreat. Obviously, there is also the snap feature to think about as well, but to reiterate again, you will see that most decks by pool 3 have more than one win condition. Of course, there are also other locations like Subterranea that completely fucks up the probability I just talked about whenever it graces us with its unwanted presence. This location almost feels like it reads, draw rocks on every subsequent turn. What it actually does is increase the number of cards in your deck. Now that we know about basic card draw probabilities, what about these 4 cards? and how they affect the probability of card draws. What Quicksilver, Domino, and America Chavez have in common is the certain card draw on turn X, where you will always draw the card on a given number of turn and never before then. 
This essentially decreases the denominator term by 1, thus increasing or decreasing your probability. Let's start with Quicksilver. For our opening hand, we will always have Quicksilver with two other random cards. On turn 1, we draw one more card. This gives us 3 cards out of the possible 11 cards. Notice that this isn't 12 anymore, as Quicksilver is always in your hand and not part of the probability. Apply this to the rest of your card draws, and you see that until you draw your final card, all card draw probability is decreased. This means that your chances of drawing a particular card has gone down for every turn. Quicksilver actually has larger implications for early game. Let's take a look at a normal game of 6 turns. Your probability of drawing a card by turn 6 is only 2.27% less. Not too much actually. For a consistent turn 1, especially at lower collection levels, where there are less synergy, Quicksilver can generate value in locations such as Gamma Lab as an example. So I can still see people play this card in card pool 1. But as decks get more synergistic, this card only harms your deck, as it decreases your card draw probability. This is even truer if you're running combo cards you want to put down on curve earlier into the game. For example, a Storm and Jessica combo that's particularly strong on curve. On turn 3, your chances of having Storm in hand is 4.55% lower if you ran Quicksilver than if you didn't run Quicksilver. Domino operates in a similar fashion to Quicksilver. Instead, you draw her on turn 2, so the probability on turn 2 and after looks entirely the same, but for turn 1, you're more likely to draw your specific cards. Finally, we have America Chavez, the best and most interesting out of the three, as it serves its purpose to front load your power quite well. Let's take a look at Chavez's draw probability. As you can see, prior to turn 6, your rates of drawing any other specific card in your deck increases. Running Chavez allows all your other card combos to be more likely to happen on curve. On turn 6, you basically draw Chavez, so the overall probability of drawing a specific card up until that point does not change at all. Allow me to give an example of a deck that can greatly benefit from Chavez, the Apocalypse Discard deck. You might think this doesn't make sense. Why are we running another 6 drop if we're going to be running Chavez? Apocalypse gets 4 power and is placed back into your hand every time it is discarded which means that discarding it once places it on par with something like Hulk. Not super impressive. Even in card pools 1 and 2, you can easily achieve much higher value by playing a Dino on turn 6 or Heimdall in a movement deck, for example. Just two cards you probably ran into a lot in card pool 2. This is why we want to run Chavez with Apocalypse. It allows you to have a higher chance of drawing Apocalypse earlier in the game where you have more turns and chances to discard Apocalypse in order to buff it as much as possible. On the other hand, we don't want to draw Apocalypse on turn 6 at all because it would be an 8 point play for 6 mana. Absolutely horrible. If we run Chavez, we are guaranteed 1 extra power for free even if we don't have anything better to play. In card pool 3, this deck has even more ability to shine as you can add Dracula to your deck. Dracula discards a card from your hand and gains its power. Therefore, you can play either Apocalypse or Chavez if you have both of them by turn 6, and have the other one discarded by Dracula, basically turning your 4 cost card into a 9 point play that can be shang chi if you can get rid of your other cards before then. Your opponent also has to guess which card you're going to play and which card you're going to discard. Chavez also doesn't just benefit specific combos like this Apocalypse Dracula one, so you don't have to only run her in combo based decks. You can also get a lot of value from her with simple and strong cards like Angela. While you can still play Angela and drop 3 more cards down on turn 6, most decks run Angela for raw value. You usually want it earlier on as you have more time to drop other cards and perhaps even move or destroy them for even more Angela value. Chavez allows you a higher chance to draw Angela pre-turn 6 and prevents you from drawing her on turn 6, which you don't want to for most decks as it gets hard to get her full value. Do remember though, Chavez's main bonus is how much more consistent and stronger she makes your early game. 9 power for 6 mana is on average not a strong play on turn 6. It's kind of like you took out a loan and now she is collecting it 
as you have no other chances to draw any other card to turn things around if you aren't already winning before turn 6. So a great and unique card for some decks, but definitely not an auto-include nor OP card. Finally, Agatha works a tiny bit differently from the former 3 cards. Agatha always appears in your starting hand, but she doesn't work like Quicksilver. She doesn't take up one of your 3 initial draws, but rather just appears there as the 4th card. This means that when turn 1 starts, you actually have 5 cards in hand after the first initial draw. Therefore, an Agatha deck actually has the same draw rates as a Chavez deck with an even better turn 6 probability. However, Agatha always plays herself whenever possible, as far as I know, which is why I really recommend running Wave with Agatha. Wave turns all you and your opponent's cards in hand for cost during the next turn. This means that after playing Wave, Agatha will get rid of herself next turn, which is potentially a 14 power play on turn 4, while leaving yourself 2 more turns of manual play. I believe Wave is an auto-include in any serious Agatha deck where you're not just trying to farm on autopilot. It is also why you often see Agatha played with a discard package. You want to get rid of the dumb AI playing for you as soon as possible, while also making full use of Agatha's 14-point body, in addition to its more favorable draw percentages. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss part 2. If you want to support the channel, or request a topic, you can buy my fantasy novel in the description down below, which will allow you to request a topic from me with a screenshot of the receipt. Kreit, signing out.